Hello, my name is Nathan Stoop from Whisper, and in today's episode of Whisper University, we're going to talk about what the heck is EOS? W what is that, and, and how can it help your business? Um, so before we get started, though, I always like to say that you define success. Uh, if you define your own success, you will always be successful. Don't go out there and, and try to keep up with the Joneses. There'll always be somebody who has a bigger house or more, more cars than you, but really define success. And this isn't an excuse just to, to set your bar really low. Set your bar high for what you want uh, to succeed, uh, but you will succeed uh, if you set your own success. So Whisper was founded back in 2003 um, out of this 86 Honda Accord. Uh, yes, I had a fold-up ladder. I showed up uh, in slacks and dress shoes to do your install. Uh, and we grew. Fortunately, uh, we grew relatively quickly to enough to buy a bucket truck. Um, that's my oldest son, um, who's one month older than Whisper. I, I probably could have a whole nother show on why you shouldn't start a business um, a month after you have your first child uh, and, and your wife goes from working to not working and you go from working to starting a business. But that, that's a whole nother topic. Um, but Whisper grew and, and Whisper grew. Uh, that's my dad. I brought him out of retirement to help me uh, climb and, and work on towers and everything. Um, but as we grew, I, I realized that it was back in 2007, 2008. I woke up one day and said, holy cow, I own a real business. Um, that, that's what we all want. But once it happens, you think, wow, I mean, we had $2 million worth of revenue. We had um, about 17 employees. It means there were 17 families relying on me to make good, good decisions. So I, I started to read books. I wanted to become a better CEO. And, and as we grew, you know, I, I've talked to you guys before about how I have dyslexia. This is a shirt that my uh, my mom got me for high school. And, and, you know, I would wear it to high school and walking down the halls, you know, 10 steps later, you hear somebody laugh and go, oh, I get it. Uh, when my mom got me this shirt, I did not get it. I, I didn't understand uh, the joke and she had to explain it to me. Um, but I set out to read these books, right? As a CEO, I wanted to learn and, and I didn't read books, right? Because of my dyslexia, I listened to books. Uh, so I, I just read book after book. I can read them at, at three times speed. Uh, and I just, I sucked in all the information I possibly could. And I would come into my, my leadership team. We didn't call it a leadership team at that time. It was a management team. And I would say, hey, you know, I just read this book. We should do this. And they're like, okay, they would go do it. And, and then I'd come back the next week. I'm like, all right, we should do this. And they're like, okay, then they would do it. And then the third week I'd come in. I'm like, all right, we need to do this. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa we haven't even finished what you said to do week one. I'm like, we'll hurry up. Uh, they finally stopped me and said, well, what are you going to do next week? What are, what's our thing that we have to do? I said, well, I, I don't know. I haven't read that book yet. Uh, so one of my friends turned me on to Gina Wickman's book called Traction. And, and that's where EOS comes from. And, and, and that Traction, uh, that book, Gino had read all the same stories I did, all the same books I did. And, and he was cherry picking the same things I was picking. Uh, except as Paul Harvey likes to say, you know, the rest of the story, right? He knew what we were going to do next week because he was 20 years ahead of me. Uh, so he created the Entrepreneur's Operating System, EOS. Um, and now this isn't a paid advertisement for EOS. I just firmly believe in what it's done for my company. And, and I'm sharing our experience with it. Uh, but it's, it's really, really amazing. They have six key points. And we're going to go through each one of those points uh, briefly today and, and talk about those. Um, but at a high level, why why EOS, right? Why did we choose EOS? Well, really, because it's a systemized approach to your business. Um, meetings are run the same way. The same kind of meetings are run the same way. You know, each department is is run that way. It also makes it where you stay laser focused. Um, I'm a visionary, so when when you read the EOS or or read Traction, there's a visionary and there's an integrator. Um, think of Walt Disney and Roy Disney. So Walt Disney was a visionary. I want to build this massive theme park. Well, nowadays we think, oh, that's a brilliant idea. Every, you know, that's great. Back when he built it, um, there wasn't anything like that. There was nothing. And everybody said it was going to fail, but he was a visionary. And then Roy Disney was the one that actually got things done, right? He was the, the worker who said, I'm going to figure out how to take your vision and, and make it reality. Uh, and that laser focus that you have uh, is something that visionaries struggle with a lot because I've got 20 ideas a day, maybe one to zero of them are, are good ideas, uh, but I'm all over the place thinking about everything all the time. And, and it, it allows you, helps you as a visionary and your whole company stay focused. 
Uh, it's also a common language. You know, there's a systemized approach, yes, uh, but I found that this common language, uh, we call our, our weekly meetings level 10s, our L10s, we have quarterly offsites. Um, those are all common languages that we can use across the entire company. And we have five remote offices. We have our hub, we have a hub and spoke um, set up. So we have our hub <clears throat> and, and across the whole company, we speak this, this common language. Um, and it's everyone on the same page or everyone on the same, you know, same two pages. There's the vision traction organizer, which we'll touch on briefly today, that, that helps you get the vision from up here in my head down into uh, into paper for everybody to follow. And, and really, if you kind of sum it all up, it, it's a framework uh, for your company, right? It's a framework for how you run uh, your company. And, and that allows you to, to rest a little bit easy, right? We I've never run a business this size, and, and I've always, as we were growing, there's a lot of unknowns, and, and having a framework takes some of that unknown out of it and allows you to really scale. So one of the questions would be is, does EOS work, right? Is it even worth doing? All of these things are, 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 are all the frameworks you have out there. You have um, Scaling Up uh, by Vern Harnish. Um, you have a couple other ones that are out there that are just you know, seven habits of a successful um, uh, of successful people. Uh, th those all those are all different frameworks you can choose. But but do they work right? And one's maybe not better than the other. It's just they're different. Um, so when I will look back at Whisper's growth, um, here's kind of a chart you can see. And we started EOS. I found out about EOS in 2009. Um, I think that was early on. I think the book only came out in 2008. Um, but in 2009, and it took me about a year to start implementing, we had a lot of pushback in the company, uh, a lot of, well, what is that, what is that going to do for my job? And it's like, um, make it better. But, you know, we had to deal with those. And, and you can see our revenue growth uh, over the years. You can see it. It isn't just a straight hockey stick, but we've had really, really good revenue growth. And, and uh, 2020 was an even better year. It just didn't even fit on the graph quite right. So, I think EOS, I would contribute EOS to being a huge part of why we've been so successful. So now let's dig into kind of what, what are the different parts of EOS and, and what is it? So you have process, you have people, uh, you have issues, uh, you have vision, uh, you have data, and, and with all of those, you, you create traction. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about these uh, at the high level today. Uh, if you have any questions, by all means, please just put, um, put them in the comment uh, box and I'm happy to answer those as we go. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we can take questions at the end as well. So vision, uh, this is one where it's, it's eight questions. This is their VTO, the Vision Traction Organizer. And, and it's really eight questions to help you hone in on what is your focus? What should you be concentrating on and what you should be, what you, you should be working on as, as a company? So what are your core values? What's your core focus? You know, sometimes you hear mission statement in, in there, but really these, these again, common language, uh, we say our core values. Uh, we have our five core values. We hire by them, we fire by them, and we promote by them. Um, and then we have our core focus. Who, where are we trying to, to focus? Um, What's our uh, our ten year strategy or ten year target? Uh, I like to call this the BHAG. You know, this is the big, hairy, audacious goal from one of Jim Collins' books. This is the target that eh, there's probably no way you can get there if you did a forecast, right? It just the forecast doesn't make sense. But hey, this is what we're shooting for. We're going to try to get there. Uh, marketing strategy. So the marketing strategy is how are you marketing to to your ideal customer? What are they? Do you have a guarantee? How are you? positioning yourself to your customers? What are your three uniques? What makes you different than everybody else? Um, so those are all more high level. And I, and I love how they set them up and, and how you go through and answer the questions. Um, and then the next step of it is, is bringing it down into more of your operation side. So your three-year picture. Uh, think about it. You close your eyes and you say, okay, what, what does my company look like in three years? What, what does it, does it, need to be in order to be successful based on where I want to take it. Uh, and then from there, we have our one-year plan. And then those are our one-year plan is our goals for the year. What do we want to achieve this year to move the company forward? Uh, and then we have our quarterly rocks. So quarterly rocks are uh, goals, but we like to call them rocks because if you do the big rocks first, 
the smaller things will kind of fit in. And so we call them rocks and um, everybody in the company has at least one rock. We have company rocks and it's to move the company forward. If you don't get this done, the company will die. So what's super important there? And then we have issues. What's our, our issue list that we're working on? And we go over these every single quarter. Uh, and this isn't something we then tuck away in our, our drawer. We literally review them kind of every week. And it's a living, breathing document that we go through. Uh, so that's the vision part of it. And this is an exercise. You, you do it with your leadership team. And it allows you to get your vision. If you're the visionary, it allows you to get your vision that's in your head more onto paper. And I did it with my leadership team because it was a collaborative approach. Obviously, I was guiding the, guiding the conversation because it's I'm the visionary, um, but that's something that, that we worked very, very hard on. And it's an iterative process uh, as you go through it. Uh, the next one is people. I, I think people is so important. You know, the only thing that sets us aside uh, or sets us apart from our competition really um, is our people. How do we treat them? Uh, how do they behave? How do they perform? Um, we're, we're not necessarily faster than the cable company. There's a lot of cable companies we're faster than. We provide faster service, but we're not necessarily faster than cable. Um, we're not necessarily uh, able to build everywhere where they can. Um, a lot of places we can build faster than they can. Uh, but really what happens is, is our people is what set us apart. How we treat our people then determines how they treat our customers. So it's, it's kind of hard for me to be a uh, let's call it a mean or a bad uh, employee manager or boss um, and, and have core values that are all about the bottom line and all about just, you know, squeeze everything out of the customer you possibly can and then go down into my customer service representatives and tell them, be as nice as you can and help the customer and do everything you possibly can when I squeeze the employees and I try to get everything out of them and everything out of the customer. Um, so people are super important, but with EOS, you really look at it on an individual level, um, right people, right seat. Uh, and if you remember Jim Collins book, good to great, he talked about the bus where you got to get the right people in the right seat on the bus. And then you'll, you'll just, you'll move forward so much faster. And I don't like that analogy. Um, I, I was talking to, to a venture capital person out of California and I was mentioning to him that I didn't like the analogy of the bus. I like the analogy of the sailboat because the only person on a bus doing any work is actually the bus driver, right? Everybody else is just sitting there. I like the sailboat where, you know, there's certain people have certain jobs. And if you're the captain of the sailboat, it's okay for you to go down and help them raise the anchor or mop the deck. But you have to remember that you're the only one that can be that captain. So if you're not spending your time being the captain, uh, your company will suffer. So I mentioned that to, to him and he says, oh, well, I'll, I'll have to mention that to, to Jim next time I um, next time I see him. I'm like, really, you know, Jim? He's like, oh yeah, I went to college with him. I'm like, oh, can I be there for that? That'd be awesome to meet Jim Collins. Um, so right people, right seat. Um, are they doing what they're really good at? Um, a lot of people can adapt and, and, and do a good job, but it's, it's short lived or there's a lot of stress on them. Uh, we've had several employees, especially early on when we didn't have a good hiring process, we would hire the wrong person. They were the right person for the company, right? So they fit our culture, they fit our values, um, but they were the wrong seat for them. And and we we moved them around. Instead of moving them out of the company, we would move them. And it's amazing to see an employee that was struggling that either didn't get it or they didn't want that job, but they just took it because, or they didn't quite have the capacity to, to understand what they needed to do. And Voila, you put them in a role and they just shine. I always say I, I like to, I like our employees to think about Whisper when they're in the shower um, because that means you're thinking about, oh, how can I do my job better? How, how can I improve Whisper? How can I help the customer more, uh, whether it be an internal customer or an external customer? So getting people in the right seat um, is sometimes painful because that means you might have to move the wrong people out, right? You move them out of the company uh, or move them into a different department but the more time you spend on that, the better off your company will be. And you'll be amazed at how much easier it is to all be rowing in the, in the same direction. So the next one is data. Um, I, I like the saying that if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. Uh, while I firmly believe in practice being a former athlete, I know my competitors are definitely not practicing, right? They're, they're out and, and they're keeping score. Um, so you have a scorecard, you have measurables, um, kind of like KPIs. Um, but these are not, um, it's not a monthly thing. It's not a quarterly thing. 
uh, that's too late, right? It's a weekly thing. How are we doing? Green lights, good. Red light, bad. What are we doing to, to win? And you have to decide. Just picture yourself on a deserted island, and you can only get five to 10 numbers um, that tell you how well your business is doing. No explanation, just five to 10 numbers. Uh, what are those five to 10 numbers? Uh, and one of the examples I like to use is our installers, they are very concerned about failed installs. They're very concerned about canceled installs, meaning the customer said, yes, I'll, I'll do a, um, have your service, but they cancel before, the before our installer gets there, so it messes up their schedule. They're very concerned about number of truck rolls for service calls, uh, the number of service calls that were required um, that they thought maybe we could have helped over the phone. So that's their department is super, super. That's our field guys. They're really, really in tune with what are their numbers looking like? How many jobs can we get done a day? But on the leadership side, we may not be interested in that much detail. What we're interested in is total net new customers. So how many new customers did you install minus how many you lost? That's what I really care about. Um, so so your, your scorecard is different depending on where you are in the organization. And that's totally fine. And they they feed up to to the the overall data that you have you collect for your company, um, and for us we we did one where we turned on online billing. We were trying to get a lot of our customers to sign up for online billing, and it was super super important to our leadership team. So we added it as a scorecard. It was on there for six months as we tracked, and we were winning, and we were getting more and more people to sign up. And then once it was like, hey, we're getting 90% of our, our customers to sign up for online billing, there was no need for us to monitor that again. So we took it off. It was something that we didn't need and things have gone uh, really well. So data is king, right? In, in, this in, in this time in society, having data is super, super important. Um, but having leading data and being able to use it as a tool, not an after the fact. A lot of small businesses, unfortunately, well, I didn't have time to do the monthly report or I didn't have time to do the quarterly report and I don't know my financials exactly. Um, they, they see doing numbers and data as a burden as opposed to uh, an actual tool that you can use. And EOS makes it a tool by a scorecard on a weekly basis. Uh, so that's people, that's vision and that's data. So those are kind of the, the ones that we have that the, um, kind of went over those with high level. Now you start and you get into issues. So issues are um, uh, issues discuss and solve. Um, we we had our managers meetings uh, in my neighbor's basement because he was one. He was my former partner, um, and we had things up on the board. Right, we had written up on the board. What what do we have to get done to move the company along? What what are we doing? And this, we had these managers meetings once a month. Um, and then I we stopped having them in his basement. We moved into an office, and I went down into his basement like two and a half years later. And I looked at the board and I was like, huh, wow, that's from our last meeting down here. And okay, that one's solved. Oh, nope, that one's still a problem. Nope, that one's still a problem. Okay, that one's solved. And what IDS is, you're supposed to identify them, discuss them and solve. Solve your problems. So that way you're not just, I mean, you guys have all been in meetings before, right? Where it's the same problem over and over and you can't ever fix it. You want to solve it. And if you can solve it, then guess what? You get to move on to other issues, right? There'll never be a shortage of issues, um, but you work to solve those and you do IDSing and you, you work on that to try to really solve and move your company along. Uh, so it's important that you have those issues uh, and, you, and you can raise them uh, in a safe place to, to talk about them and figure out how do you move the company along. Uh, the next one is process. Um, and I think this one is document documented, but then a very, very important one that I see a lot of people miss is followed by all. Um, so I love going and talking to other WISP and other business owners. And, and a lot of times I'll ask them like, oh, so what's your sales process? And, and they'll take me through their 10 step sales process, which is totally fine. I don't care how many steps you have, if it's working for you. But in the process of taking me through their 10 step um, sales process, they usually eliminate two or three steps. Like, well, I don't know why we do that anymore. That was old equipment and that's the way we had to do it before. Now we don't have to do it that way or that was our old CRM. So when you have processes, you need, they're living, especially as a company that's growing really fast, they are living processes and you need to be able to tweak those for what your needs are. Uh, and we want to document 20% to get 80% of the results, right? I mean, we, we made the mistake earlier on, we had a wiki 
everything was in the wiki. Everything was screenshotted. We were super, super process driven and it was in the wiki. And anytime anybody asked a question, we're like, it's in the wiki, go look it up. And by the time we were done with the wiki, half the stuff was outdated, right? We had changed our process or, or the outside world forced us to change or we had a better idea. So that data became very, very antiquated and or that that documentation became very, very antiquated. And it was really, really hard for us to to keep it updated um, because we were trying to document 100 percent that one off case that happens every six months. We had a we had a process for it. And really what we want to do is document 20 percent of the work to get 80 percent of the results, meaning that 80 percent of your job, it, you can find it in the documentation. Those one-off cases that happen every once in a while, that's where, oh, you should go to a more experienced employee. Somebody who's been here a lot longer might know, right? Or you have your core values. Who are you as a company? What do you stand for? And you use your core values to help guide your employees because you're never going to document everything. You're never going to have this is exactly what you need to do. Um, and another example of, of how we went kind of overboard is we had a contract um, you had to sign in two places. It was five pages long, sign in two places and initial like five different places. And it was crazy how long it was. And the reason we were doing that is because one customer would screw us over, right? Well, I didn't know this was the case and I interpreted it this way. So we would change the language. We'd add a paragraph to make it very, very clear that if they moved and didn't give us back our equipment, they owed us the full amount of the equipment or whatever it was. And they had to initial. And if they didn't initial, they missed one, our installers had to go back and, and get them to sign it. We were punishing 99.99% of our, of our uh, customers for the 0.001% that actually screwed us over. So we were adding all this complexity to what we were trying to do uh, with our processes when we could have very easily, and we ultimately did, get rid of all of that and say, yeah, the one customer who's like, no, I'm not going to give you back your $300 piece of equipment um, because I read the contract this way and I'm, I moved. I can't even find it. Okay. It's not the end of the world. As long as it isn't happening all the time, we're totally good. So processes are very important. It makes it consistent. Uh, it, it's the framework and the way you look at your processes. Um, but then followed by all uh, is something we, we have those five remote offices and those five remote offices, it is challenging to get processes down to them and then also get processes back up. Like, what are they doing that's amazing? And that it's a lot of work and you really have to think about your process. So if you do all of those, then you create what's called traction. And, and that's where, you know, we have rocks and meetings. So there's more, traction isn't the outcome. There's, there's more to it a little bit. We, our rocks are our 90 day, uh, what are we getting done, right? We're getting things done. We're solving problems. We're setting important uh, them done. And then we do our level 10. So our L10s are once a week. Um, and those make sure we're on track for our rocks. Uh, and then our rocks make sure they feed up to our one-year plan. Our one-year plan feeds into our three-year picture. Our three-year picture leads into our 10-year target. And, and it all kind of fits together. Um, so when you when you have all of these different pieces, um, you actually, you, you gain traction and you can really, really move your company along. And if you remember the graph I showed you, there's a lot of, a lot of things. Um, a, a, a lot of that is attributed to our ability to implement traction. And we did some things great. We didn't do some things great with it. Um, but that's, that's what we were able to do, um, uh, with traction. Uh, so I'll kind of pause here and see if there are uh, any questions. Um, I, I know one of the ones I get all the time is, well, what's in the L10? What's a level 10? And, and, and what, what, is, what is that? And I, I'm not going to have time to go over that today, but a, a L10 is a, a format for how you run your meetings. So a lot of people are in meetings that are just bad, right? There's no value. You have, you know, counts up like our leadership L10 is the most expensive meeting we have. Well, maybe our company meeting is the most expensive because we have everybody in the company are all hands. But, you know, our leadership, if you look at the hourly rate is super, super expensive. And if you're not getting anything out of it, why have the meeting? So the L10 has a set agenda, not a set topics, but a set agenda. And you step through it and it all feeds into the, the vision, people, data, process, issues, traction. It, it's all of those combined in this meeting. And the reason it's called an L10 
is that it, you want it to be amazing. How do you get how do you get to a level 10 meeting? So they take a lot of that guesswork away from that and say, here's the agenda. Now there's certain ways you need to follow this. And, and I've had employees who say they follow it not quite right. Uh, and then when we come in and, and teach them the way to really follow it, they're like, wow, that's amazing. It, it really, really does work. So uh, I would highly uh, recommend that you read the book and they talk all about how to how to do the L10 in that since we won't have time today. Another question that I see here is that, um, you know, how, how does EOS deal with leadership, right? How does it fit in with leadership? And, and I think, you know, EOS is a, is a framework again. And I think EOS is something that is really, really good. And, and really good leaders can do amazing things uh, with EOS. Um, if you're not a very strong leader, I think you're going to struggle with, with EOS. Um, you won't get the most out of it. It will help you. It'll help you a lot, really. But I, I don't think you're going to get um, everything you you can out of it because EOS isn't about leadership. EOS says, well, as a leader, you need to do these, right? You need to make sure you have the right people in the right seat. It doesn't talk about how to kind of coach them. It does give us the tools to hold them accountable, right? Are you getting your your rocks done or not? I had a, a COO one time that we brought in that... Um, missed every one of his rocks the first quarter. And we're like, well, wait a minute, you know, you every week we say, are they on track or not on track? Uh, and and he he was saying on track. And then by the end of the quarter, he was off track. And it's like, wait a minute, the whole question is on track means you're going to get them done by the end of the quarter. You should not come up to an end. Um, and, and that really, really helped me. That was a tool that when I went to meet with them and start to apply pressure that you're not doing your job properly, you're not quite getting it. Uh, he he saw, and it was in clear English, right? That no, you didn't you didn't get your rocks done. Uh, so we we gave him a, another quarter. He still didn't get his rocks done as we worked with him there. And then I started to sit down with him, and he chose to leave, you know, um, because he knew he just wasn't getting it. Uh, so that, that's an example of where I feel that that EOS was an amazing tool to help me be a leader. Um, but if I wasn't a good leader, I may not have had that conversation or I may not have uh, chosen to go down that path with them or I could have accepted excuse after excuse. So I think for me, the the, the leadership, and I'm glad somebody asked that question because the the next one, I, the next slide I have is actually a little bit on our, our, our built to lead that we follow here at Whisper. And, and we've kind of married the two together. Um, EOS is the framework as to how we run our business and and our common language around that, how the the formal side of our business more so, if you will, accountability, um, traction uh, for, for solving problems, uh, all those things that go along with having a formal process. Uh, and built to lead is about our leadership and about our people and about, you know, how do you become the best version of yourself? And they're really complementary. I don't think if we had if we had done we've only been doing built to lead for about a year, year and a half now. But if we had done built to lead um, instead of EOS, uh, we would have grown. Maybe not as fast. Maybe faster. I don't know. Um, but I, I firmly believe that with both of them together, uh, we're able to to grow even faster and scale faster because we have now two common languages that are that they coexist. They don't replace. Uh, whereas if you went like with a, a, a Vern Harness uh, um, scaling up and everything, those you might replace some of the common languages of, of EOS. Um, but we're able to combine these two together and work on the people. What do you believe as a person? Who are you as a person? And how do you then move the company forward? And then EOS is the framework with, within how you move the company forward. So I think they're great. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, people look at both of those uh, and, and uh, learn more about them. So to kind of wrap it up, um, why EOS? Again, it's a systemized approach uh, to your, your business, how to run it. And I think another thing I get a lot of pushback, well, my industry is different. My business is different. We're, we, we're not the same. It works for any industry, uh, for sure. Sweet spot, probably about 10 people to maybe about 200 employees. Um, but Chucks, if you have three people, I would highly recommend you start EOS because hopefully you want to grow. And as you, as you add more and more people, you'll know exactly how to do that and where they kind of fit into the organization. Helps you stay laser focused. Um, it's a common language for across all of your, all of your departments and all of your employees. 
uh, keeps everyone on the same page, um, which is very similar to the laser focus, but I think um, the same page is who are we as a company? What are we striving for and how are we trying to get there? Uh, and then it's the framework. Overall, it's a framework for your company. So thank you so much for, for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot. And uh, I'm so so glad to be able to share this with you. Um, please uh, check us out on, on YouTube uh, and Facebook uh, for more, more of our sessions. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks so much.